However, your dream boat is uh, a needle in a haystack, and you might die single if you wait forever for him or her to show up. So all of us have to trade off value against time, and at some point... <laughs> at some point set up house with the best person we found so far. Now this leads to a prediction which is abundantly fulfilled, and that is a sorted of mating by mate value. That if you look at any large sample of couples, you'll find that the husbands and wives, or the boyfriends and girlfriends, are closely matched in desirability to third parties. That is, the tens marry the tens, and the nines marry the nines, and the eights marry the eights, and so on. But I think we'll all agree that this conclusion, well established in social psychology, does leave something out of the, uh, the whole process. And that is the irrational part of love, the involuntariness and the caprice. All of us know people, in fact I'm sure many of us are people, who can remember being fixed up with someone who would seem to be the perfect match. They, you can tick off all of their traits, they're nice, they're good looking, uh, they're uh, good sense of humor and so on, but for whatever reason, you just don't click. Uh, Cupid didn't strike. The earth didn't move. Why would we as a species be built this way? Well, in fact, there are a number of economists who say this is exactly how you ought to build a species because of an inherent problem for the perfectly rational strategy that I alluded to at the outset that they call the commitment problem. Romance is a kind of promise. You're promising to spend the rest of your life with someone, to bring up children together, to forego opportunities to be with someone else. And there's an inherent problem with any promise, which is that a hypothetical rational agent might find it in his interest to break the promise. Uh, and that the problem is how do you guarantee that the promise is credible. In the case of romance, since uh, you've had to set up house with the best person you found up to a given time, by the law of averages, someone better is bound to show up in the future. The only question is when. Perhaps uh, Tom Cruise or Cindy Crawford will move into the apartment next door and be momentarily available. <laughs> At that point, a perfectly rational agent would drop you like a hot potato. On the other hand, since you are also a, a rational agent in this hypothetical scenario, you could anticipate that and you would never have made any kind of um, agreed to the promise to begin with, anticipating that it would be in the interest of the other party to break it sooner or later. Well, the solution is that if you uh, don't decide to fall in love for rational reasons, perhaps you're less likely to decide to fall out of love for rational reasons and that the very involuntariness of rom romantic love serves as an implicit guarantor of the promise. It's an example of, uh, one of many examples in which a lack of freedom or rationality is paradoxically an advantage in situations of negotiation between two intelligent parties. For example, the law that um, allows the bank to foreclose on your mortgage and repossess your house decreases your freedom, your freedom to live in the house without paying back the bank. On the other hand, it's only that law that made it worth the bank's while to lend you the money to begin with. And so, paradoxically, that law works to the advantage of the borrower, not just the lender. Another example is the law that gives, defines the rights of corporations. It says that corporations have the right to sue and the right to be sued. The right to be sued? What kind of right is that? Well, it's the right to be able to engage in a promise with some other party that has the potential to be harmed if you renege on the promise, and therefore it makes your promises more credible. Now, this is a, a clever idea. It comes from the economist uh, Robert Frank and uh, the uh, theorist Thomas Schelling and others. But is there any independent evidence for it, aside from the fact that it seems to uh, resolve this paradox? Well, I think there is. One of them is simply the a uh, fact that romantic love does appear to be a part of the biological repertoire of the human species. And this is a controversial claim. The consensus among many intellectuals is that romantic love is a recent invention of, uh, romantic, of uh, uh, provincial troubadours or Hollywood scriptwriters or romance novelists. Uh, 
But in fact, a recent uh, anthropological study by Yoni Harris has surveyed the world's cultures and finds that reports of an emotion that we would identify as romantic love can be found in all the world's cultures. Indeed, it's, um, it raises the question of why it's such a common belief that there's no such thing as, as uh, love. Well, I think the reason is that romantic love is a nuisance to parents who would just as soon barter or sell their children in arranged marriages and therefore have an incentive to spread the disinformation that romantic love doesn't exist. But apparently it does exist. Another is the psychology of courtship. Uh, if you were to whisper in your lover's ear, you're the nicest, smartest, best-looking, richest person I've been able to find so far, <laughs> It would probably kill the romantic mood. <laughs> the way to a person's heart is to declare the exact opposite, to say that the emotion is elicited by the unique idiosyncratic properties of the individual, I can't help falling in love with you, and to emphasize how involuntary and irrational it is. I want you so bad, it's driving me mad, etc., etc. <laughs> I also think that the... Um, Another puzzle that I think this theory resolves is why the emotions tie up the body as well as the brain. When we're in the throes of passion, romantic or otherwise, we show it. We blush, we blanch, we tremble, we sweat, our voice croaks, we get uh, expressions on our face. And uh, uh, this has long been a puzzle in physiology. And I think one explanation is that we are giving a credible signal that our current course of action is not under the control of the voluntary circuits of the cerebral cortex and therefore is a course of action that we have talked ourselves into and could talk ourselves out of, but rather that that course of action is under the control of the limbic system circuits that are control the physical plant of the body and therefore are, is a course of action that we can't so easily talk ourselves out of. Now, if passionate love and loyalty are guarantors that our promises are not double-crosses, by symmetrical logic, one could show that passionate vengeance, or a thirst for revenge, or desire to defend one's honor, is a guarantor that our threats are not bluffs. There's a problem with issuing a, a threat, and that is that the target of the threat might force you to carry it out. And you could get hurt if you carry out a threat, since the target of the threat can anticipate that, they can, in a sense, threaten you right back by refusing to comply and therefore render the threat a meaningless bluff. Well, the way out of that problem is to be so constituted that it would be an intolerable insult not to let the, uh, the um, insult go uh, or the injury go unavenged and to pursue revenge or a sense of honor even uh, regardless of the costs that you incur. It's only that that makes the threat credible to begin with. So let me conclude um, and uh, acknowledge that uh, to some people the uh, kind of analysis that I've been presenting might be seen as a cynical view of uh, human nature. And most people don't like to think of themselves as a system of computers designed by natural selection to promote survival and reproduction. On the other hand, I think that there are some uh, facts that are simply undeniable to any scientifically literate person, namely that the mind is a product of the brain, that the brain is a product of evolution, and that evolution is not guaranteed to produce niceness. On the other hand, I don't think it's a cynical view, and in fact, I think it offers, in a way, uh, more room for optimism than some of the uh, older views of thinking of the human condition. The idea that the, of the three ideas that I opened with, I think the idea of computation implies that the human mind is not just a bag of crude drives and reflexes, uh, but is composed of intricate, ingenious, and powerful software. The idea of evolution suggests that our legacy from the natural world is not just greed, aggression, lust, a thirst for blood, a territorial imperative, and other uh, nasty drives that have been mistakenly equated with Darwinism, but that by the same token, our capacity for love, friendship, and a sense of justice are also the legacies of uh, biological evolution. 
Finally, the idea of specialization suggests that some parts of the mind, those with the longest view of the future, can devise ways of outsmarting the other parts of the mind. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much.